Well, I'm out. I don't know. I'm out. Okay. <laughs> um, and then in between all the laser and high voltage, we're going to have Dave Gunderson talking about something entirely different, which is um, um, energy and water management on a huge scale, um, e.g. the Hoover Dam. And so he's been very involved with um, um, what happens to the water going in and the energy coming out of the Hoover Dam. And I think that'll be a pretty interesting talk, uh, of course, entirely different from um, um, what we've had kind of surrounding it. And as always, I'm open, very much open to suggestions for presentations. Um, so be sure to send me ideas um, or names of people, or if you want to do something, um, let me know. Um, so um, that out of the way, I'm gonna introduce Jay. I will be monitoring chat. If you have questions, um, um, Northwest, uh, sorry, Erica, it was the Northwest Makers Group, uh, not tech makers, so makers, Northwest Makers. Um, um, if you have questions, put them in chat. I'll monitor that. And um, um, Jay has suggested that when he, in between demonstrations, he'll, uh, he'll take questions. So um, um, Jay um, has been, let's see. Where did Jay's bio, oh, there you go, plasma. So yeah, I've just been uh, chatting with, with um, Jay and he's been, got interested in this back in high school days and has done this as purely a hobby for him. He has a whole different um, life outside of YouTube, although um, probably the YouTube side is more fun. Um, and um, so he calls himself a, a public educator on this. I, for one, am terrified of high voltage. Um, when I was younger, I've certainly plugged myself into the wall more times than I can count. But you know, 110, 120 is about the max for me. So this should be really fun. Um, as I mentioned uh, to Jay, uh, for my birthday, my wife gave me a, a little Tesla coil kit um, straight out of China with one page of instructions all in Chinese. So uh, I'm going I'm going to dive into that uh, pretty soon and um, see what that see what I can do to myself. Um, but um, with that, I'm going to um, quite off now. I'm going to turn it over to Jay. Um, and again, if you have questions, put them in the chat uh, room and Jay, it's all yours. Excellent. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, Jay, I, I operate, I'm, I'm the producer, I'm the, the host of Plasma Channel. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard of that channel or not. It's basically a high voltage centric physics based kind of edutainment channel. So I try to educate, but not with too many equations, nothing too number rich, because I, um, what stuck with me in high school and college physics was the concepts. You remember the concepts for the rest of your life, but you kind of tend to forget the equations. So I just kind of cut to the chase and I teach conceptual physics. So um, first of all, sorry if there's a bit of an echo. I have a wood floor and I live in a studio. Uh, uh, this is actually my filming backdrop, but usually I'm using a lavalier mic, so less echo. Uh, I'm gonna show a couple of things here to try and paint the picture, the narrative, the narrative that I firmly believe in um, is that uh, physics is, is, is kind of the language of magic and that magic is science, science is magic. Um, and a, a quick prelude, you're gonna see some things that some of you might have already seen and I'm gonna show you something at the end that I'm positive, probably 90, 95% of you guys have never seen before. And online, I've already been called a cheater and a fake because of it, because it just looks so fake and magical. Um, but that's the beauty of high voltage physics. Um, so I'm going to start out by, I'm, I'm sure you guys have all you know, uh, heard in the scene of Tesla coils, but they're an excellent model for uh, demonstrating energy transformation. So when I first saw a Tesla coil, I thought, OK, big sparks coming out. That definitely means, oh, a bunch of power. It's generating power. It's a giant power plant. Um, and again, I don't know what your guys' knowledge base is, so I'm going to try to touch on a, a wide spectrum here. Uh, Tesla coils actually consume energy. Less energy comes out than goes into them. Um, a good example here is a small uh, handheld rechargeable Tesla coil I built. Um, now, uh, there's ty a type of lighter called an arc lighter. And it's a brilliant invention that somebody came up with a couple of years ago. It's absolutely brilliant. It uses a little high voltage arc. 
and that's how you light your cigarettes or whatever you want to light. But you can hijack them and use them as a power source for a small spark gap coil. That's exactly what this is. Um, now, quick note, uh, excuse me for a couple seconds as I kind of switch camera angles and lights so you can see what I want to show you. Um, so give me one second while I kind of scoot you guys closer. And I'll be turning out the lights for a second here. Uh, let's take a look. Is that dark enough? That might just be dark enough. So what's going to come out of this small spark gap Tesla coil, um, everything, most of the things I build are designed to be touched. They're designed to be um, non-lethal. Might give you a really nasty shock, but that's about it. What comes out of, uh, what comes out of the arc lighter is about 5,000 volts, but at about one milliamp. Well, this Tesla coil goes ahead and boosts it up to about 50,000 volts but at a much lower current as well. Um, here's a bit of a demonstration. Hopefully it's, I can turn out some more lights if this doesn't work. Ah, one second, two lights still. That ought to do the trick a little bit more. You can't see anything. Ah. Now that is only about a half inch spark, but with the calculations I've ran with that small coil, the configuration that it puts out, it's, it is actually closer to about 40 to 50,000 volts, depending on the top load that I use. Um, are, 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 is, there, is, there able to, is there feedback? Is anybody able to tell me, were you able to see any of those sparks? Yes, absolutely. Um, Jay, um, looked great, sounded great. Excellent. Okay. Also, there's a question in um, in chat. Uh, is there any concern about that uh, metal chain you're wearing? Ah, uh, not a metal chain. Are you talking about the necklace? Uh, that yeah. is that is a uh, hippie fish hook from Maui. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. On a cotton thread. So we're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> if that was a gold chain around your neck, would that? Um... Wonderful question. Whoever whoever asked that wonderful question, and with it is going to come a small story. I swear it'll be fast. For my senior project in high school, I built this Tesla coil. Uh, it's about a 400 watt Tesla coil, stands about three feet tall. Anyways, I bring it into the room, and especially because it was the era, it was 2006, uh, hoop earrings were definitely all the rage for the ladies. Big, big hoop earrings. Um, well, everybody's curious about this big Tesla coil, and I I get ready to turn it on and I'd give them just a split second burst of power and you know about half meter long sparks come out. I tell them, by the way, before I turn this on full power, I gotta let you guys know any closed loops of metal in the vicinity could potentially heat up. And if there's a gap in the loop, if there's a small gap in the loop, it'll spark between. And I looked at all the ladies and I said, uh, and I pinched their ears. I was like, uh, that means you guys. And after I turned it on for a split second to show them what this big Tesla coil was, they all rushed, really, like took their earrings off really fast. Oh, oh, and they threw them down and then I cranked it up to full power. Um, so to answer the question, yes, if this was a metal necklace, it actually wouldn't do too much because this is a very low power coil. This is a five to 10 watts, but larger coils, if this was a metal necklace and say the necklace uh, had a kink in it and there was a dis you know, a broken part of the metal, but it was held together still somehow, then that metal would spark between the two ends of the broken chain. If it's a non-broken chain, it actually won't do too much um, unless you get to really high power levels with a Tesla coil, then it induces a pretty big current in the chain and it'll most likely just heat up. It actually wouldn't shock you. Um, otherwise for lower powers, it needs to be kind of a break in the chain with a small gap and then a smart, uh, spark will jump between the gap. So uh, this is a small model. I have other ones to show you here as well. This is the, one of the smallest coils I've produced, about five to 10 watts tops. Uh, a couple of reasons why it's safe to touch. So every, that high pitch noise you hear, when it comes to Tesla coils, the noise you hear is a certain frequency. That frequency is dictated by how many sparks per second happen out of the top load. Uh, modern Tesla coils, solid state Tesla coils, you can audio modulate that using very complex circuitry to produce music. I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of um, perhaps, you know, audio modulated Tesla coils. 
Um, so first of all, the pulse rate of this uh, is actually, it's a very fast, very short pulse rate. And while there is a fair amount of current in each single spark, the uh, pulse duration and the time at which my body experiences the current is extremely short. Uh, coupled with, there is still some skin effect that takes place. So some of the electricity travels around the outside of the body when you touch a small powered Tesla coil like this. Um, if you guys know what a skin effect is, it's this miraculous ability of high frequency electricity to travel on the outside of a conductor, as opposed to 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz if you're in Europe, that'll mostly travel through the entire conductor, a little bit on the outside, but the higher the frequency you go, the more the electrons travel on the outside of a conductor. So when you get shocked by a very high frequency Tesla coil like this, very high frequency, I think this is, if I remember right, uh, uh, I wanna say 1.2 megahertz, that travels on the outside of the skin and it's safe. So you got uh, short pulse duration makes it safe, low power makes it safe, and also the skin effect. Now jumping it up to a little bit more power here, still quite safe to touch, is another, another battery powered um, coil I have here. Let me, let me move the camera real fast. And after I talk about this coil, I'm gonna make a point about energy conversion, which is the point in the first place. And then I'll take questions just on Tesla coils and we'll, we'll move on here. Um, now this is designed to run off about 15 volts. You can also run it off of uh, one nine volt battery. And I will need to turn the power out for this. This is also a classic spark gap Tesla coil, not, not a modern solid state one. Uh, I'm very partial to spark gap coils because they are darn near impossible to break. Uh, you can't break a spark gap because it's just a gap of air. So I love them, they're resilient. Um, so what this is, uh, it takes 15 volts in the base. Yeah, hard to see. It takes about 15 volts in the base. Uh, it goes through a flyback circuit that boosts it up to about 10,000 volts. That charges up capacitor dumps it into a variable spark gap uh, through the primary coil, and then it resonates uh, between the primary coil and the secondary coil here. Uh, this will produce a bit more voltage. Uh, running it with a nine volt battery is at about third, one third power, but I figure uh, in the dark, it should suffice. So keep in mind what you're about to see, uh, power to the one nine volt, and what's gonna come out is uh, drastically more than that. Still nothing crazy, you know, keep in mind it's a nine volt, but the output's still pretty cool. So one second here. And like I said, I have a point to all of this. Uh, after I'm done with this, I'll talk about energy conversion. Let's see, yeah, yeah, sure. Do, 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 do. Move the camera up a little bit. All right, let's see if this baby uh, will purr. Keep in mind, it's just nine volts. There isn't much power to work with in the first place. Yeah, not much. Okay, let's get you closer. So sparks, not last time. We're talking about a little less than an inch. But the beauty of spark gap Tesla coils, um, as old and rustic as they are, if you want to change the output pulse rate, sparks per second, and simultaneously the size of the sparks, it's as simple as adjusting the distance of your spark gap. Uh, hey Jay, can I yeah. interrupt please? Uh, two things, one is you suddenly got a lot fainter um, after that demonstration, so I was having trouble hearing you. And two, can you explain exactly what it is that the spark, the spark gap does? I mean, it's a gap with the spark, but... Absolutely. What's its effect? Abs uh, absolutely. Can you see me right now? Yes, this will work better. I can see you, but you've gotten a little fainter. Is, um, unless I accidentally turned down my yes, volume. You didn't accidentally turn down your <laughs> no, the volume went down. It's yeah. automatic volume. Uh, maybe you had, um, you might have an automatic gain control that went, uh, when it heard that loud um, buzz turned itself it's down. It's still down right now. Yeah. Hmm. I've never had that. And I've even shocked my own computer before. And <laughs> I've never had that problem. Yeah, you're a bit faint. Hmm. 
Uh, how quiet am I? Am I? Well, I can hear you. You're just quieter than you were okay. before. Oh, You're about thirty yeah. dB down from previous. How much down am I? <laughs> about thirty dB. Thirty decibels. Thirty dB down. That's a big difference. Um, why is that? Yeah, it is a big Massive difference. difference can you run? Can you run the spark gap in reverse? Settings, you may well be. Uh, <laughs> All right, Eric. Automated <laughs> volume, automatic volume control. And there's probably a checkbox that you need to uncheck and then manually adjust the gain. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me go to <clears throat> audio settings. Okay. Oh, yeah. That is very low. It's very low. No. One second. Yeah, no problem. Is this any better or is this the same? Not yet. It's the same so far. For some reason, it's not allowing me to uh, increase my input volume. Uh, is, that on, is that a Zoom control or your computer control? This is a, this is a Zoom control right now. Um, I'll, yeah, get out of, um, go off to the computer control out of, you know, aside from the Zoom. Are you on Windows? Uh, I'm on Apple. So let Apple, me Mac. Up. So let yeah, just adjust the volume. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can click on the speaker in the very top bar of Mac OS. Yeah. And that will allow you to bring up the system. Uh, the system Is this OS. better? Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So what I'm wondering, Great. it was actually a computer issue, not a Zoom issue. Yeah. I'm wondering what happened is I'm about a foot and a half away from the computer. Normally Tesla coils don't affect my Apple, but when you, when, you know. when you had the spark jump to your right hand, to the right side as you face the Tesla coil, it was mm. fine. When you put your left hand up, it was probably 60 dB louder, the spark. Yeah. Interesting. Let's try a quick experiment here and then we'll move on. Yeah. Let me see what it does right now. Yep, my, my input volume decreases every single time I shock myself. I'm watching the input bar go, woo, what an interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it got on, on that game control or something. That's pretty funny. If, um, in theory, the other things I'm going to show you sh shouldn't uh, have that effect because they have a lower uh, EMP pulse, much smaller <laughs> EMP pulses. It's okay, you know how to fix it now. So we're I do know, I do know. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make the sparks a little bit bigger. <laughs> And then you can explain the spark, the spark gap question. Yeah, what is it about? Yeah, let me. Yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and talk about the spark gap. It's absolutely brilliant. It's classic 1800s technology. Um, the brilliant thing, and this was going to be part of my little spiel about energy conversion. The brilliant thing about electricity, it's not as simple as a battery powering a flashlight, or it's not as simple as you plug something in and it works. It's this magical. It's a beauty. And spark gaps, what they do is if you have high voltage, you can charge up a, one second. Ah. You can charge up a really big capacitor, right? <laughs> a capacitor is basically a battery that uh, operates differently, but you can charge it at a certain rate and you can discharge it in a split second. So imagine a AA battery that you can discharge all the energy in a split second. That's what a capacitor is. Well, what a spark gap is, is that's your switch. So in high voltage systems, if you're charging up specifically a high voltage capacitor and you want to just dump that energy in a, in a couple milliseconds. So tremendous amount of power 
just spill it. That's what a spark gap is. So you charge up a system and then basically right across the outputs of a capacitor, you go ahead, you have two leads that are bare wire and at a certain voltage, the air basically freaks out, breaks down, it can't take that voltage and it ignites. And then now you're basically short circuiting that capacitor. That's what a spark gap is. You're basically short circuiting the capacitor to do something with it. And traditional Tesla coils are 100% dependent on that system working. They have a high voltage power source. Every single traditional Tesla coil uses a high voltage power source. It charges up a high voltage capacitor. And when that capacitor gets to a certain voltage, that spark gap, again, it has two bare wires that are very close to each other. But at a certain voltage, that air stops becoming an insulator and starts becoming a conductor. So the moment it reaches that critical voltage, which is dependent on distance of the spark gap, uh, spark forms, the capacitor dumps its energy into the primary capacitor, or sorry, into the primary coil. And that's what starts the energy conversion process. Uh, does that, does that uh, make a little bit of sense? Yes, thank you. It, it's sort of like slurring throwing the switch really, really fast that allows a lot of current all at once. Correct, yes. Where the air itself ionizes and turns into a plasma. Correct, yes. That's and, and then the other magic is the difference in the windings between the two coils. Part of it, yes, part of it. A traditional transformer uses uh, windings ratio and, and inductance ratios. That's what's uh, interesting about Tesla coils and what Nikola Tesla did was something a little bit radically different. Um, let me show you a little bit higher uh, power level here and watch my audio inevitably just tank. But uh, keep in mind, this is still just a nine volt battery. Let's go ahead and turn out this light. Let's see here. It's a bit hard to see. We can see it and we can hear it. Okay, a bit hard to see. The other things I'm gonna show you will be much more visible, I do promise. So um, that spark gap as mentioned, as Ken mentioned, is basically a high voltage switch. But that switch is just composed of air. Air can't break. Uh, it can momentarily break and that's when it ionizes and boom, dumps all that energy from the capacitor and just dumps it in a couple milliseconds into that primary coil. What's different about Tesla coils no matter the size, no matter the size of the Tesla coil, what makes them different from a normal traditional transformer, which is based on a turns ratio, five turns in, 50 turns out, it means you have 10 times the voltage going out. Uh, Tesla coils also rely on capacitance, uh, a ratio of inductance and capacitance in the primary circuit and a ratio in, uh, to inductance and capacitance in the secondary circuit. And you can tweak those two variables and you can get voltage boost tremendously higher. Um, so again, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so the energy conversion, the, the point I wanted to make is what's coming out of this little nine volt battery. Uh, it, this is a higher current one. It can actually output about an amp at 8.4 volts. It's a lithium ion version. So 8.4 volts, one amp. So we're talking 8.4 watts of power. That's it, uh, very low power. But what goes in is 8.4 volts and at full, full voltage, this outputs about 100,000 volts. Um, so the point of the energy conversion is that power has been boosted by about 12,000 times. Sorry, the voltage has been boosted by 12,000 times, but the power is actually not higher. It's technically less because you've wasted a bunch of energy in the process and each spark lasts for just a couple, couple milliseconds, which again is why it's safe to touch and also why it's actually a lot of current in each spark. Uh, but it's just a couple milliseconds. So it's the same concept as a capacitor. You store up a bunch of energy and then you can release it in just a split second. And that's kind of what a Tesla coil does. Each big spark you see is just a bunch of energy that's been stored up and released in a split second, but it does it over and over very fast. So even when you see a big Tesla coil with giant sparks, um, if you take a high, uh, a high speed camera and you slow it down, it's composed of individual pulses that makes up the big spark. Each pulse is just the capacitor dumping its energy every time. Boom, 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 boom. 
Uh, let me pause for a second. No doubt I've confused uh, a couple of you on that one. Uh, any questions? How fast would it drain that 9-volt battery? Good question. Uh, the, since this is a lithium-ion 9-volt, um, at that lower power level with the shorter spark, we're talking, I think with my particular design here, it lasts maybe a couple of minutes. Okay, so yeah, it pulls yes. out pretty quick. Yeah. I usually, it's great to power this, this with a larger lithium ion batteries. Uh, uh, with the 15 volt, it'll last uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, um, okay, other people, anyone else, feel, do feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and ask questions, you know, when, when Jay pauses like this, or ask questions in chat and I'll, I'll send them mm -hmm. off to Jay. Um, is that a, um, that particular test coil, is that of your own design or do you, um, you know, cause you said there's these variables, you know, on, on certainly how many, um, how much capacitance, the, the number of Quantities, how big they are and stuff and so are there equations that you plug in or do you do this there are uh, I can't cite each equation by heart but it's again uh, conceptual science that's my specialty and the beauty is yeah how a Tesla coil boosts its voltage is the primary circuit which is that there's two circuits at play the primary circuit is that primary coil and that primary capacitor they form one circuit the secondary circuit is the secondary coil and technically the secondary capacitor, which is going to be your top load and an invisible connection kind of down to the earth. So the way it boosts its voltage is brilliant, brilliant, real brilliant. Primary circuit has very low inductance, but very high capacitance. But then the secondary is flipped, very high inductance, really low capacitance. So when you trade one element for the other, in that situation, it drastically boosts the voltage. Um, through a concept called resonance. Uh, um, no doubt a couple of you probably heard of electrical resonance before. Um, but yeah, so the, that was, those are two examples. Apologies if it was a little hard to see the sparks of low powered battery power Tesla coils. Um, I'm gonna show you an example of one that is technically a, a small solid state Tesla coil, um, kind of on the, on the fence being an actual Tesla coil. It's called a Slayer Exciter circuit. It's another one that I've designed. Uh, this one is completely silent, and I'm curious if it's going to mess with my audio. We'll find out. There we go. Okay. So this is, uh, the formal name is the Slayer Exciter Circuit, but I built, it's a, it's a flat version. What's cool about Tesla coils and Slayer exciters is this tall secondary doesn't need to be uh, a tower. It can be a flat wound spiral of copper. And the primary, this primary is this blue wire wrapped around the base. The primary of this, you can't even see. It's a couple turns of wire wrapped around the edge. Uh, this is dramatically higher frequencies, so you can't actually hear the sparks. But let me show you them. Uh, this uses three of those 9-volt batteries, and you have 27 volts coming in and about 5,000 volts coming out. Um, extremely high frequency, so you can't hear it. Um, one second here. Let's see what it does to my computer. <laughs> Spectacular. Okay. 20 bucks says my computer is going to have no idea what's going on. <laughs> okay, what's wonderful about these very high frequency Tesla coils is they do a wonderful job of lighting things up wirelessly. So this is just the power light. They do a wonderful job of lighting up any kind of gas nearby. So this is just a normal fluorescent bulb in my hand. Um, and that's because that extremely high frequency electricity uh, sends out an EMF field that uh, fluctuates really, really, really fast. The gas inside of these lamps, they can't take it. It, it breaks down, it, uh, it ionizes inside. It's, it's too much electrical tension for the gas to handle. Um, another example of what a very high frequency um, power source will do 
Here is a better demonstration. Now this is pretty cool. This one is a tube full of Krypton. Let's see, I don't know. Can you see the individual strand of light? Can make out something. Maybe a little too bright. There are, um, looks like little bubbles and being connected by a lightning bolt. Yep, that's essentially, it's little glass beads and the arc is traveling ah. between them. But, um, so again, what's happening when you have, you can do the same thing. Let me turn on the lights. Not happy. Here we go. You can do this exact same experiment with any coil. This larger one, this smaller one, uh, the, the big guy right here in the back corner. As you'd imagine, the bigger the coil, the longer the effect, uh, longer distance you can go with lighting up something wirelessly. Uh, but again, it comes down to uh, in a partial vacuum, gas is more conductive until a certain point when you get to a complete vacuum and it doesn't conduct. Um, all right, I'm, I'm about to move off, but I just want to emphasize the, again the point of energy conversion. Let's make it simple and say this guy is powered by 10 volts, and again, out goes 100,000 volts. Higher voltage does not always mean higher power, uh, because when it comes to electricity, current and voltage multiplied each other equals power. So you can have 10 amps, 10 volts, and still have 100 watts. Or you can have one amp, 100 volts, that's 100 watts. Or you could have 100 amps at one volt, and that is still 100 watts. So that's the beauty of transformers. Is, as the name suggests, they just transform the energy to do what you want with it. But it's the same amount of power in and out. But since we live in a perfect world, there's energy loss. Technically, Tesla coils put out less energy because there's energy loss through heat and vibration. Um, so I got two. We have a, a question that came in here, Jay. Yes, absolutely. Are there plans uh, available uh, for building these coils? I have to know there are, but um, um, you want to talk about the availability of plans or kits or such? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, when it comes to this one in particular, actually, both of these in particular, I shot videos about. They were DIY videos. And there's step-by-step -step videos. It covers about 90% of the necessary steps to build each uh, each one of these. Um, I'm happy to link those or have or have Ken uh, maybe follow up and provide the links, for those two videos. Um, besides that, there are a lot of commercial kits to buy Tesla coils uh, of varying terrifying levels of power. <laughs> some, of them, some, of them are, well, some of them will burn you. Some of them will blow your finger off. Yeah, just kind of depends. Uh, um, I have a, a question. So if you had a Tesla coil in, say, a Faraday cage, so essentially it, it, you've got no connection to the outside, no ground, does that mean there's no capacitance, uh, no sec essentially no secondary, or, or and does it just sit there and hum, or does it get hot and explode? Are you they're talking about kind of in a theoretical world where the Tesla coil isn't even touching the bottom, it's just kind of hovering right in the very center? Yeah, let's talk about that first. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So, in in a theoretical world like that, um, due to the positioning of the primary coil, it, it, okay, let's back up. The shape of the Tesla coil makes a big difference on the voltage and where the voltage actually appears highest. What's interesting about the vertical style secondary Tesla coil? It's the classic style everybody knows about. As you go up away from the base, the voltage increases and, and actually live time. You could say it's 5,000 volts here, 15 here, 30, 45. So where you actually place the secondary coil and where the electrical ground is makes a big difference to uh, what the voltage is out here. So if you don't have a ground, if you're in theory floating in the middle of a uh, hypothetical Faraday cage where you're not touching any part of it, you would still have um, a higher voltage coming out of the top. But since you have no ground, the ground, so to speak, which on this guy is a counterpoise, conductive metal on the bottom. A counterpoise is kind of a cheat of uh, where you don't have to use an electrical ground. There'd be sparks coming out of the base and sparks coming out of the top in this theoretical Faraday cage. Um, 
And then outside the cage, there'd be very, very little, if any, uh, electromagnetic interference because it's a Faraday cage. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that uh, answered your question or not. Yeah, I think so. I, I Continue, please. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right, the next two things I'm going to show you. Uh, one of them, I'm going to turn the lights. It'll be a lot more visible. Um, it is a new toy of mine that we've all seen plasma globes. Um, this guy is a beast. It's a big one. It's 15 inches across. Um, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. And I think it's an excellent demonstration of some pretty wacky, really complex physics. Um, so I'm going to show you that. And uh, then I'll end with something that the lights need to be fully on to see. So uh, that'll be much easier to see. So, so I got I to gotta scoot you guys back to see this. Rachel, Rachel. All right, so uh, this is yeah, like my new favorite toy. It's uh, it's a multicolored. I need to move the camera up still. It's just so big; it's hard to get on camera. Perfect. Okay, uh, before we begin, uh, does anybody know why certain plasma globes have different colors inside of them? Different gases. Different gases, excellent. Um, does anybody know any other uh, reasons why there'd be different colors as well? Uh, different, the band different gap, flat. the band gap in the in the in the uh, gas transition between the electron positions that are available. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And then on the on the grand scale as well, I uh, actually shot a video about this recently. Turns out it is a uh, tremendous amount of variables. Even the pressure, the pressure, the partial pressure of each gas inside of the, glo the globe, because there's a combination of gases. The individual partial pressures will also determine the color as well as the amount of energy actually flowing through each streamer. So what I'm about to show you is, um, I think one of those beautiful demonstrations of a myriad of variables that come together to make a display. So let me show you this really fast and I'll talk about it. Let's see, is that in camera? That is in camera, good, good, good. Uh, it looks a little dim on my camera, but it still looks cool to me. Do you do you guys see three colors or just two? I'm seeing green and purple. Okay, and maybe a little white. A little hard to see, I guess. There's uh, technically, yeah, you got green streamers. You've got high current blue streamers, and then uh, I guess the camera's having problems picking up. The tips are a bright red little hard to see and what you're seeing here so when you touch a plasma globe whether it's a small globe or a large globe like this they're all the same when it comes to the science which is we, we take them we really take them for granted we go oh it's a party trick it's a real party ball cool they're actually very very interesting they are a solid state they're a solid state tesla coil a modern solid state tesla coil Come on, light, there we go. So uh, anybody who's broken a plasma globe or taken apart, you'll know that they also function off of high voltage. They're extremely high frequency, modern solid state Tesla coils inside them. They excite the gas because the, uh, the electric field, uh, it's an AC electric field that vibrates very, very fast. As you mentioned, it uh, rips electrons off of the uh, gas atoms really fast. And as they reabsorb a gas atom, um, you have these transition states that happen with photons being emitted with different colors. Long story short, different gases produce different colors inside the globe. Um, but also when I touched it, you had these bright blue streamers that indicated high current pathways. And as I mentioned, the amount of power through the gas also determines the color. Um, so the high current pathways were kind of a bright blue. And that was also, that was an ionization of the krypton. That was an expression of actually all three gases were neon, krypton, and xenon. But when 
you get into bright blue, that's a stronger expression of um, the 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 uh, the xenon actually. I'm sorry, the xenon. Um, so plasma gloves are really uh, good teaching tools when it comes to uh, a bunch of variables that come together to make electrical sparks. Uh, do you guys have any questions? I know I didn't talk a lot about it. Do you guys have any questions about plasma globes? Um, so this is something you, you built yourself. Did you obtain a, um, the globe? How, to what degree is it a vacuum? How did you evacuate so, it? Uh, or how much of that is commercial? Or yeah, great question. Uh, I, this is not something that I built. Uh, I am working on having that level of skill, but I'm not quite there yet. This is from a company actually based out of uh, Vancouver, BC called um, Aurora, uh, Aurora Plasma Design. Um, and so they, they, just, they got a bunch of different options of globes and I just got the one that I thought was the coolest, but it's, I got it and I thought it was a cool, a cool teaching tool. Um, not good enough to make my own plasma globes yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, if there's no what, other... what, what is the pressure inside? You know, how, how deep the vacuum is it? Good. Yeah. yeah good question. Um, I always thought that it was a super deep vacuum. It turns out not entirely. The company shared their mix with me. They were nice enough to. For this one, it's called a red, blue, and green globe. It's ba, 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 ba. so 760 torres, one atmosphere is 14.7 psi. Um, it is 560 torr neon. So you're already talking about three quarters pressure neon. Um, it was like 30 torr xenon and 50 torr krypton. So vast majority neon and still a partial vacuum about negative three psi inside here so not not a total vacuum you know you only about negative three psi compared to the outside yeah cool thank you yeah i put a link to that company in the chat group oh cool so you can go there they have a very pretty home page yeah <laughs> yeah I, in making the last video because I, I you know i called them up and i got a, I bought a globe and but they were nice enough to uh, like give me some of their industry secrets since i was making a video and stuff and there again we take plasma globes for granted as a nice little party trick if you just take the time to appreciate the physics inside of them it's mind-blowing and that physics you know involves everything from different gas types to different power levels to the fact that it's a little tesla coil inside to the fact that those are not just light that you're seeing those little lightning bolts little tiny ignition pathways that are ionized from high voltage it's just it's all kind of cool um if that globe were yeah. to break that was essentially you have yourself a Tesla coil and shoot sparks or what have you. Yeah. Correct. Uh, and you'll find actually a lot of YouTubers that have like broken plasma globes to see what happens. Um, since it's a partial vacuum and it's a noble gas, they're usually full of noble gases primarily. Those tend to be more conductive, so to speak, than just open air at a normal pressure. So if you actually break this um, and you turn it on, you won't actually see anything. If you bring your finger near the center, You'll probably pull a, a spark about as big as what you saw out of my Tesla coils to your finger. Um, but you won't see any ionization. You won't see any streamers going around uh, because now you've broken the glass and that noble gas has drifted away. So. All right. Last thing. Uh, again, like I said, this would be the most visual thing. No guarantee I can pull it off because uh, it also involves a lot of variables, but it's what you can do when you put together a lot of the concepts I've mentioned, which is low current, high voltage, energy transformation, um, you can levitate stuff with your hands. So that involves charging yourself up to a fairly lethal voltage. So if you haven't built the device yourself uh, and don't know what you're doing, I wouldn't recommend doing this. <laughs> I shocked myself really bad the other week doing this, all right? Let's turn on the lights. <clears throat> Let's see, this is, this is a bit brighter. Yes, excellent. Okay, I'm going to bring you guys in closer. Um, has anybody heard of a voltage multiplier by chance? Yes. I okay. Yeah. Can anybody tell me the difference between a voltage multiplier and a Marx generator in terms of the output? That's a good question. I want to know what a Marx generator is. I don't know what that is. Okay, yeah. And again, this is a point to me asking this. Um, a Marx generator 
brilliant device. You charge up a bunch of capacitors at the same time, but then you have them built up with a bunch of spark gaps so that they all, all the capacitors charge up at once, high voltage, but then the spark gaps are assembled in such a way that they short circuit all the capacitors lined up end to end, uh, you know, theoretically end to end, and the voltage goes from the voltage of one capacitor to the voltage output of all the capacitors combined. Since it's a spark gap, Marx generators are pulse based. Boom, boom, one giant high energy pulse of energy and then it recharges, recharges. Um, and that's what's usually used for like lightning testing on airplanes and installation testing for uh, power lines. They'll have industrial three-story sized Mark generators. Kind of thing that if you get shocked by it, it'll blow your arm off. It's high power. But the difference between that, and this is a voltage multiplier. Instead of uh, spark gaps, you know, same thing used in Tesla coils, these use diodes. So the diodes are on the back right here. Uh, kind of hard to see the light. There we go. These are diodes assembled in a certain way that charge up these capacitors. So that you feed it an AC power source. And the difference between a Mark generator and a voltage multiplier is while the Mark generator does these pulses out, pulse, 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 and it's pulse dependent. It either pulses or it doesn't. This puts out a constant high voltage power source. It gets a little more complicated than that, but basically this allows you to have a constant high voltage out, which is why I'm gonna use it for this. I'm gonna charge my body up to about 100,000 volts, and I'm gonna step on an insulated plate that I have on some plexiglass on the ground, insulated from the earth. And then I'm going to attach one high voltage output to this base, and use it to levitate a little piece of foil Kind of with my hands. So I'll, I'll do it and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the science behind it and then I'll take questions on what hopefully I'm able to pull one off. More, one question came in while we're talking about the voltage multiplier. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, so, uh, buck boost. What's that? Uh, something called a buck boost. B-U-C-K. Boost. B -U -C -K. Oh, a buck, a buck boost converter? Yeah. So yeah. It, what is that? It, 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 Admittedly, the, the, the you know, boost converters and, and buck boost converters, I'm not phenomenally versed in. Maybe I accidentally know about them, but I just, uh, okay. I'm not too versed in it. I think they're the, more or less the same thing, but instead of using diodes, maybe they use FETs. Okay, oh, uh, okay. That could be the case. I've, I've had some friends down in Austin try to get me into boost converters and I've just never, Admittedly, I've never understood boost converters too well. <laughs> you can't get it wrong. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good Thank question. You. All right. Uh, give me a second to set this up. There's about a 50% chance you will see me shock myself, but I've, again, designed this to not actually hurt me if that happens. So the output on this is the high voltage out is here. The electrical ground is down here. So you're going to see me attach a wire to the top. That's going to go to the plate that I stand on. And then I'm going to attach the high voltage return to the ground down here, which attaches to the metal plate. And it all makes sense in a second. Which doesn't always work as intended. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. Let's take our first piece of foil. I'll move you guys in closer so you can see as well. Right about here, all right. This experiment uh, slash demonstration is, um, it relies on the ability of uh, high voltage electric charges, uh, basically static electricity. Uh, it's the power of attraction, the power of electrostatic attraction, but applied to a kind of groovy effect. All right, let's see, so what do I got here? You guys should be able to see this. A Little bit more light. All right. There we go. 
All right, so at this point, it's an open circuit. If When I turn this on, it's an open circuit from me stepping on this conductive plate. I'm attached to this, which puts out about 100,000 volts. And if I get too close to this, uh, I'm, it's going to discharge through my body. But um, I've done this enough to kind of figure out what distance to be a way to make this work. Might take a couple attempts, but when it works, it is, it's groovy. <clears throat> Let's see, let's give it a try. Well, oh, it repelled itself. One second here. Um, this is also a video that I shot as well about electrostatic levitation. Um, and I, I go into detail exactly the science in that video as well. See if it works. <sighs> Told you, it's a bit of a trick to it. For some reason, it is wanting to fall towards me. Don't know why it's wanting to fall towards me. Hmm. Do this the, the old fashioned way. There we go. Do you guys see that? Yes, that is very cool. I had to throw it in there. I wanted to be able to do this by turning it on, but. And you can actually sometimes get quite high off the plate and it'll still levitate. Close your hand and it goes away. So, what you just saw. The lower plate, let me discharge myself. Lower plate is a relative zero volts. The plate that I stepped on and shocked myself multiple times with, approximately 100 kilovolts. So I'm on that plate, so I'm charged 100 kilovolts. Uh, 100 kilovolts and negative, actually. Negative and the ground is a technical zero. Um, this shape right here is specific. Let's see if you guys can see that. All right, round top. Flat bottom, sharp edges. One of the brilliant things about high voltage is it likes to jump off of sharp points. It causes ionic wind at sharp points because the electric field gradient is really, really high. That causes an ionization of the, the air, even if you can't quite see it, maybe it's too bright, there's still an ionization happening. And ionic wind shoots out of those corners. That provides thrust upwards. So how do we get this charge in the first place? My body's charged to a negative 100 kilovolts, and when it gets within proximity of my hand, the electrons in the foil are influenced by the abundance of electrons in my hand. Uh, that forces the electrons down and away. Technically, it absorbs electrons from the top air, but then shoots them out through the, co the corners with ionic wind, and it gets thrust. So then in theory, you'd be like, well, why doesn't it just shoot up to your hand and stick there? Well, that's the beauty of the sharp corners. When it gets too close to your hand, it has a really, really strong uh, influence on the foil and it shoots off even more electrons out of the edges and it actually loses its charge and it falls back down. And when it falls back down towards the ground, it doesn't have that same um, capacity to lose that charge. And just by being near your hand, it kind of builds up the charge again, gets too close, oh, drains its charge, gets too close, drains its charge. So it's called quasi-stable levitation. It's levitating an object. Um, quasi stably using electrostatic forces. Um, do you have any questions about what, uh, what I just showed here? So is this really different from just a static electricity? You know, you shuffle across the, um, you shuffle across the carpet, you hold your hand over your hair, the hair stands up straight. Um, that's, you know, that's just a detractive force. But this Correct. is actually literally shooting ions off. So the interesting thing is, um, it's it's the same. It's actually the exact same style of electricity, and it's the exact same science behind it. If you if you rubbed your feet across the carpet fast enough, and you held a sharp needle like a like a like a sewing needle, and you turned out the lights, 
and you rubbed your feet viciously across the carpet, every once in a while you can see the tip of that needle glow a bright uh, whitish purple, just barely, but you gotta have your eyes accustomed to the dark, wait for them to adjust to the dark, and then rub away with your feet. That's because that, that sharp point is uh, accumulating the, uh, the electrons. Uh, they have a tendency to accumulate at sharp points. And that purple you're seeing is ionized gas because it's creating ionic wind out of the tip of that little needle. So it is the same science happening here, but just instead of rubbing my feet on the carpet, this is my foot rubber. This produces a constant current high voltage DC. Um, again, different from the Marx generators that do like the pulses. This is the constant current DC and charges my body up. And this kind of is the same thing as that needle in your hand, except I'm not holding it. It kind of is uh, stuck behind a rock in a hard place. It wants to go to my hand, but then uh, it gets too close to my hand and it loses its charge and it falls back down. But then from distance away from my hand, it kind of gets attracted again over time. So you get quasi stable levitation. That is very cool. That is very cool. That was a, a neat demo. Um, it's great. You can talk for about an hour now. There's some great demos. Uh, let's definitely open this up for, for questions. Yes. Um, uh, I know um, I asked plenty of questions, but uh, hopefully some of you out there in uh, Zoom land have questions as well. Um, um, I will ask uh, Jay for additional links, um, some of which were in the announcement, but um, I'll get, gather some other stuff up. And it usually takes me a couple of days to get the video loaded up, but I'll do that. Um, but anyway, questions, anybody? Other um, um, requests for demos? Um, I have a question uh, waiting for other people. You talked about the, um, um, the solid state Tesla coil. So essentially you're replacing the Tesla gap with a fast switching system? Correct. So power transistors? Correct, yeah, you, you know, you do a half bridge rectifier or a, a series of different MOSFETs depending on your power level and you, Modern Tesla coils still operate the exact same way, relatively, as the traditional spark gap kind. You just, yeah, you've replaced that spark gap with a modern version of a switch, which is going to be usually a transistor. But there's a lot of really complex control circuitry to both protect that transistor from blowing up and also to make sure that transistor turns on and off at the rate that you want it to. And what is the frequency? You talked about different frequencies. Um, you know, so like the Slayer coil was a higher frequency, but what were, what kind of frequencies are we talking about on say the, that Tesla coil and the, the Slayer? And I, I guess I have to clarify, there's two, two depends how you look, look at it, there's two frequencies at work. Uh, the actual electrical resonance frequency, so the frequency at which the electricity, so to speak, bounces up and down in this uh, secondary coil. And there's also then the frequency of sparks coming out. Okay. Um, this the frequency of spark coming out of this is 280 hertz, 280 sparks per second. When I make it the longer sparks, um, where it drops down to about 120 sparks per second. But the whole time, regardless of the spark size, um, the resonance of a secondary coil is determined entirely by um, how much capacitance you have and then the length of the wire, so to speak, and the inductance of the secondary coil because of the physical dimensions of the secondary coil and the capacitance attached, that'll dictate the frequency. This one's, I think, 780,000 Hertz, 780 kilohertz. Um, this guy, like I said, I believe is 1.2 megahertz. Again, purely dictated by the physicality of the length of wire on the turns and the capacitance on top. Okay, I have a question from um, the audience. What is the purpose or application of the solid state Tesla coil, Tesla circuit? Is anyone using these things for anything other than science demonstrations? Uh, great question. We got these things, little party balls right here. <laughs> <laughs> I well, it's, cool. it's, a, it's just it's more or less uh, a solid state Tesla coil. It's not actually, but it's kind of very close. Because Tesla circuit, well, he wanted to broadcast our, um, you know, wirelessly around the world. Uh, but you know, is there, are there any um, practical applications today? Oh, you know, I actually was thinking about this the other week, and there is actually a list of very applicable things uh, solid state tesla are used for. But at this moment, it honestly escapes me. Um, <laughs> they, they tend to be more of a hobbyist. Uh, I'm doing it a great disservice by not telling you. I just can't think of it at this moment. 
Yeah. And most common use is, is hobbyist and as physics demonstrations. Uh, many people, including some friends of mine down in Austin, uh, Architect, the musical performance groups that oh, yeah. uh, perform uh, using musical Tesla coils. Um, something I want to touch on really fast. I don't know how much more time people have. You have all the time you want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> people I'm haven't saying, dropped off yet, so that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. And I'm saying this because you can mention Tesla's ambition to spread power wirelessly. This is what's really, really cool. Whether it's a solid state coil or a traditional coil, what's really cool about this. So every single Tesla coil is a radio transmitter. Um, the best of my research, here's what's crazy about it. The best of my research, every Tesla coil by definition is illegal in the United States, but the FCC doesn't care uh, because they are broadband transmitters. They transmit at every single frequency and they jam local radios. Um, I've tried this jams up to about 200 feet away. Uh, any radio station that you can go to because it's a broadband transmitter, which is, <laughs> which is why they're illegal because then it transmits over emergency stations too. Uh, so that's a weird fact. I don't know if you guys know that. Technically, most Tesla coils are illegal, but the government doesn't care. Um, and two, those radio pulses, the radio transmissions that come out of Tesla coils and why Nikola Tesla was going to transmit power this way, when you suppress the spark, say I use a top load that's got a wide curvature, so no sparks want to jump off because it's just a really smooth surface, the energy still has to go somewhere. And this is kind of part of the story of the energy conversion. You put energy in, that spark gap has fired in the bottom. The energy has resonated up here 780,000 times a second. It has to go somewhere. So when you don't see a spark on a Tesla coil, invisibly it's emitting, uh, you know, essentially radio waves. And so the energy goes into radio waves. When you draw the energy out with a spark, you can do this. You can do this with a, a radio. Take a small Tesla coil, turn it on, spark it to your finger, and the radio won't pick up too much static from 10, 15 feet away. You take your finger away, and no sparks come to your finger, suddenly the radio's jammed. Because the energy has to go somewhere, either into your finger or pff, as radio waves out in the space. So, the idea so it's, it's, kind of a, it's really cool, like the energy has to go somewhere. So the idea, Tesla's idea is that stuff is just radiating out out there and anyone with an appropriate antenna would just pick it up correct and yeah have enough power to be useful not just noise on the radio correct yeah and that's also why we look at the wardenclyffe tower um the wardenclyffe tower design showed a very large dome over the top and part of that was to suppress any corona and was to suppress any spark leakage uh, and loss of energy through sparks into the air so uh, it's actually kind of cool that's why the wardenclyffe tower had a big ball up top because he wanted that power to go out, not in the form of sparks, but in the forms of wireless energy. Interesting. Yeah. Let's see, Eric says, uh, AM radio best 200 to 1000 kilohertz. <laughs> I'm kind of quoting Eric Green. By the way, you two might enjoy each other. Um, Eric works for uh, Seabird in uh, Philomath. And what's the name of the company you work for in Redmond there, uh, Jay? I, I work for, I work full time for a company called Wildlife Computers. Wildlife Computers, yeah. It's, sure. uh, yeah. Marine biology sensors, or we we, we design, produce, and, and sell the uh, GPS satellite tags that go on animals that you want to research, and they transmit to the satellites, tell you location, temperature, uh, depth, stuff like that. Cool stuff. Uh, it's kind of just by random chance that I actually landed a job that's loosely related to Tesla coils, because because radio transmissions are loosely related to how a Tesla coil works. Yeah, um, it's just crazy that we've gotten to a point with technology. Again, another thing we take for granted is radio. Mm -hmm. We all really take it for granted, at least, I don't know. It's phenomenal, radio. You, with a quarter of a watt of energy, you can contact the satellites. That's what our tags do, they're quarter watt pulses. You can reach a satellite 400 kilometers away. That's the physics. When, when I think about, you know, this has the Wi-Fi and the um, GPS receiver and the Bluetooth, and um, um, the cell radios, and and we just use it. It's just yep. there all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. If there aren't any other questions, I'm going to let you all um, go. Um, that was fantastic. I enjoyed every minute of it. I hope the rest of you get this as okay. well. And um, I will be posting the um, video um, 
you know, it's going to take me a few days and uh, get it up there. I'll um, get some links from Jay. And if any of you have ideas on um, future presentations or projects that you might want to tackle together um, in the new um, North End uh, Maker Space, we'll be talking about that in April. Um, and meanwhile, thank you all very much for attending. Um, I do have one last question. Um, you mentioned low power out. What is the efficiency of the Tesla coils that you have? Ah, that's a good question too. Um, most spark app Tesla coils are not tremendously efficient. Um, I believe it, it, they're, they're relatively the same depending on the size that you make them. Um, I believe a spark app Tesla coil tends to run about, I want to say it's 60% efficient. Don't quote me directly, but it's, it's not tremendously efficient because a lot of energy goes into the, the spark gap and then energy goes into the noise. Um, there's just a lot of energy loss in them. I think it's 60% efficiency. Okay. Is it better with the solid state? Very much. Yeah, solid state are much, much more efficient. Um, there's is a lot of advantages to them, but the reason why I like Spark App better is, man, is it easy to wreck a modern Tesla coil. Right. Because yeah, you can wreck them really easily. So that's why you got to design them right. And I just like Spark Apps are good, solid. Uh, I like 19th century technology. Yeah. Yeah. You can't break a Spark App, it's just in the air. Right. So. Great. Okay, um, I, uh, Eric's asking about the URL for the makers group. I'll post that. Um, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Jay. Um, thank you, everybody. That was awesome. I love thank you, Jay. Jay. Absolutely. Okay. Sorry if I rambled off there. I was a little excited, but um, yeah. I'll go ahead and make sure and provide a link to my channel uh, where I probably explain things a little bit more coherently. And uh, uh, there's a video on this and that. And actually, these are all from videos. So I'll link those. All right. Okay, thank you all. Over and out. Thank Have everybody. a good evening. Have, Have a good, good week. Um, everybody stay safe, wear your masks, and um, have a great holiday season. We will meet again on January 11th. Um, stay tuned for further announcements and um, over and out. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.